Hey everybody, welcome back to Romer. Uh, today's gonna be a little bit of a throwback episode. We're gonna be talking cars and trucks. Casey's here with me, he'll join me in a second. Uh, and what do I mean by a throwback? Well, that's how we got our start. If you've been with us for a while, started out doing car reviews, and we absolutely love everything automotive. Um, and we really transitioned over the last few years into more off-road oriented vehicles, adventure vehicles. We got the Jeep Wrangler 4xE right here. Casey's LX sitting up on the street. We got a GX 470 also in the driveway. We even have the trailers, right? So if you've been following us, you know we've got the Sasquatch Highland 60. Casey's got the UEV Conqueror. Uh, been doing gear reviews and all of that. But like I said, some things have been happening in the automotive space that we want to highlight. Some of it electric, you know, electrification related. Some of it, you know, traditional automobiles in the truck and SUV space. But the one that we're going to focus on on this episode is up here on the screen and a really, really unique vehicle. And I promise there's more to it than this, but this is what makes it so special. On today's episode, we're gonna talk about the 2025 Dodge Ram Charger. Okay, Brian, so here it is, and you've already screwed up the episode because it's not a Dodge Ram Charger. Dodge Ram doesn't exist anymore. It's just Ram. So it's the Ram Ram Charger, which is somehow better. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. We grew up in Dodges. Dad yeah. was a big Mopar guy, so I'm used to that. But I did mess up, and you guys were going to tell me that I messed up. You, you're phenomenal at that. And uh, the only thing I would ask is earn the right uh, to tell us where we did wrong, go ahead, like, and subscribe to the channel. Like mm -hmm. the video, sign up for notifications, all of those things. Mm -hmm. All right, so 2025 mm -hmm. Ram 1500 is all new. We got uh, an all electric version of the truck coming yeah. at the end of this year as well, but that's not the one we're interested in. This is the one that we're interested in, yeah. and it is the Ram Charger, mm -hmm. but what makes the Ram Charger unique? Electric architecture, right? It mm -hmm. is completely driven by electricity. Yes. Right? All power delivered via electric motor and battery, sort of. Yes. But it does have an engine in it. It has a Pentastar V6. What? Pentastar V6 that functions only as a generator to recharge the battery. So 130 yeah. kilowatt generator. Mm -hmm. Mounted right on the back of the engine, charging those batteries at all times. Yep. Yeah, I, sh I shouldn't say at all times, as right. needed. As needed. Okay, and what's fueling that generator? I'm uh, sorry, what's fueling the Pentastar V6? Gasoline. Oh. Regular old gasoline. Dinosaur juice. Yeah, but you said as needed, and that's important because mm -hmm. most of you won't need it very often. 99.9% of the time, you're not right. going to need it. Because it has 141 miles of pure electric range on a wall charge. Yes. 92 kilowatt hour battery. That's correct, which is a big battery. Right. It's a big battery, but big trucks take big batteries. Physics is undefeated. Undefeated. Okay. Yeah. And that brings up a big point, why this is so fundamentally different and why we're excited about it. Because we've actually long been proponents of plug-in hybrids mm -hmm. and a different approach, something other than just going pure EV. Because we live in a big state, Yep. All right. And yeah, we've got major metropolitan areas all over Texas, uh, but there's so much room in between and most of the state is uncovered by EV charging infrastructure. Yeah. Right. So, you know, to make any sort of road trips or do things that trucks need to do. And in Texas being the number one truck market in the world, they need to do certain things to be successful. Um, this is a unique approach that we think is going to work in the market uh, in particular here. Right, so most of the time, all EV, mm -hmm. but what do truck drivers need? What, it, at least not once you're just driving to work every single day to the office and back, what right. do truck drivers want? You need payload, mm -hmm. um, and maybe more importantly, you need to be able to tow. Over distance. Over distance, yes. Not just in around town, to Home Depot, and then home, right? You've gotta be able to, go to the next metropolitan area or whatever, towing heavy loads. So that's a big part of the truck market here. And we think that's really the game changer for the Ram Charger 
what they were going after from the engineers. Absolutely. And there's been a couple of interviews lately with the engineering team, and they highlighted that. They said the biggest obstacle to truck EV adoption on a broad scale was the limitations that towing presents. Right? So you're going to lose 60 to 70 percent of your EV range uh, if you're towing a trailer um, at its towing capacity for mm -hmm. the truck. And you know, they pointed out the example, they got a hold of an EV truck, probably we think an F-150 Lightning, um, and barely made it 75 miles at, you know, towing, um, you know, a 10, 11,000 foot pound, pound trailer. Yeah. trailer. Drop that in the comments. <laughs> um, so this solves that because with a 27 gallon fuel tank and the Pentastar V6 running a generator, the total range, so 141 on battery. The total yeah. range, though, is another 550 miles. Now, that's highway. That's probably sure. without a trailer. Yeah. It 100% without a trailer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, max range in the 650 uh, range. Yeah. All right. That's incredible. Okay. And we heard some weird comments from folks right out of the gate. I think journalists, auto journalists in general, didn't understand this truck when it was first unveiled. They really didn't. And we heard some things, you know, from some engineers. Like, what did Sandy Munro say about this? Well, he didn't understand why you would need over 600 miles of range. Like, who cares? What am I going to do with that? You don't need that. You don't. Nobody needs that. <laughs> but if you're towing a trailer and that 550 miles of pure gasoline range, right? Mm -hmm. Well, cut that in half which you're probably going to have to do towing at the max tow rating of this vehicle, which is 14,000 pounds. Oh, it's a lot. You're going to cut that number in half at least. Now you're at two to 250 miles of range. Yep. And that's what you need to, if you're towing something like that. So you don't have to stop every 30 minutes to put gas in it. Right. So that's what it's for. It is a truck for truck people. Yes. And we should point out too, so we've mentioned competitors like the Cybertruck, uh, the Rivian, Ford Lightning even. Most yeah. of those are available. They really start at what would be the equivalent of a really high trim level, right, right for the Ram. Ram, not Dodge, is going to offer that powertrain in a work truck model. Yes. So which yeah. makes it even more clear what the target is. Yeah, I, could, I should actually bring that up because I've got pictures, uh, I think, of the Tradesman. Here it is. Yeah. And Dodge was good enough to show us a lot of the trim uh, levels that the Ram Charger will come in. So you can see there's the plug-in port. Uh, and they even threw some new home construction in behind just to reinforce what this truck is all about. It's about yeah. getting the job done, right? But that's not all, okay? So we actually have um, several different trim levels uh, for the truck. Right. So in its to... natural habitat. Yeah, I mean, you start to, to move up the range um, I'm trying to remember if this is Laramie. I think it might be Laramie. I can't quite tell, um, you know. But then you've also got um, tungsten. Ah, uh, okay? yes. So some really nice photos. So you're going to see this, like all the way up to ultra luxury. Good Lord, those are huge wheels, probably like 22s. You've got yeah. Ram boxes on the back, um, you know, nice uh, satin uh treatments all around and the interior is just spectacular which we've come to expect from ram so you're gonna be able to get this configuration in a whole bunch of different levels very curious on the off-road front you are going to get four-wheel drive with this yeah. and an e-locker in the rear yes yes so they've hinted at that so there's got to be some kind of rebel something version coming yeah although i think you can get all wheel i think it comes with it standard yes uh, four-wheel drive right right but you're talking about the e-locker right getting into more of the off-road yeah, space. Yeah, get some all-terrain tires, maybe a mild lift, whatever. I Yeah, a version like that has to be coming um, because, oh, yeah. And like Here's you said, interior. yeah, interior, more of an evolution mm -hmm. uh, than a full redesign, and that's fine because the Ram interior is still fantastic. The best. Yeah, it's still the best. It is the class leading from a right. materials and a craftsmanship standpoint. Well, so one of the big things that ram has been talking about we showed the tradesman version earlier think about that being able to tow a trailer full of stuff to the work site what you will also be able to do is power your work site mm -hmm. off of the massive battery inside the truck or your campsite exactly so that's where our mind went immediately yes was uh 
how many hours can you power an air conditioner off of that battery? <laughs> because we live in Texas. Guilty. Yeah. And you're talking about like days worth of electricity. Days. I, I wish they have mentioned the power pack that there's mm -hmm. going to be some kind of inverter set up in the bed mm -hmm. uh, to let you take advantage of all that battery power. I wish I could remember off the top of my head. How I know many... it was more than what was over comes 2000. in the F-150 Lightning, right. uh, yeah. which is a very capable setup. Yeah, so it's going to be a lot of power uh, that you'll be able to consume off of that battery. Uh, it's going to be a nice setup. And you you can pretty much ensure that you arrive at your destination with a full battery. Yes. Right. So you're running that generator the whole way. You can put in like a battery save mode. Yeah. And so when you get there, you're at 100%. Or... You know, the, the other part of that is, let's say you're in transit and you're towing something like the Sasquatch and you need to climb up a mountain pass, you can tap into uh, yeah. the battery power and the generator at the same time, make it up that pass, uh, no sweat, you know, something even twice as heavy as this, um, three times as heavy. Yeah. Almost yeah. four. Almost four. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. And then, you know, the rest of your journey charge back up. Yep. and uh, still have all of that capacity available to you. Yeah, you know, I would love to get my hands on too because I wonder on the way down that mountain pass down the other side. Hopefully, they've got a real good regen system in there mm -hmm. to help consume some of that energy. So, a lot of potential. You mentioned the adding the generator right to to get that extra power, but the other thing that's unique about this powertrain is that um, in addition to being able to charge the battery with that engine. The engine can also send electricity, well, we'll say the generator, right? Because it's really not the, the engine. But So the generator can charge the batteries. It can also send electricity directly to the motors. So if, mm -hmm. you're, if your yeah. um, battery was completely dead, which you know, the engineers will probably not let the battery die completely, but regardless, if you've got really, really low battery or you just want extra horsepower, more than the battery pack alone can provide. Uh, they've mentioned that specifically. There's some kind of mode in there where it's like, oh, you need momentary extra power. We can combine the power of the battery and the generator right. and s send that directly to the to the electric motors. Yeah. Yeah, and just looking at this cutaway again, you know, you've got your V6 up here at the front. The generator's mounted right here on the back. Um, there's an EDM in the front, uh, electric drive motor, and then, also uh, in the rear. So, um, you know, just an interesting approach. I mean, from a packaging standpoint, this is this had to be one hell of a challenge uh, yeah. just to get all of this in here. Uh, you know, I would say if there are some downsides to something like this, it is complicated. Right? It, it's complex in its own way. Right. Probably more from a software and a calib calibration perspective yeah than anything else, right? Making sure that all of those modes play nice, that the power delivery and handoff is correct, and that, you know, there's all sorts of things. I, look, I've got a science experiment back here with the 4xE, all right? I have had issues with that in the two years that I've had it uh, with the battery electric system. Uh, now, most of that has to do with the two liter turbo, you know, engine, mm -hmm. and the issues related to fuel and oil mixture in the engine and how cold weather impacts all of that. Yeah. And honestly, that's why you don't see anything like that no. in this truck. You but. see the tried and true Pentastar that Chrysler has been making for over a decade now. And that was like 150 different models. Yeah. I, I thought it was funny, you know, journalists questioned that choice early on too. Yeah. They're like, why not just a four cylinder if it's just a range extender and all that? I'm like, no, 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 no. One, like we mentioned earlier, they want to be able to send power from the generator straight to the to the, mm -hmm, uh, to the drive road. motors, right? Um, so I think you need the extra power of the Pentastar for that. But also, I just envision like a warehouse that was forgotten and discovered by an accountant yeah. as like a rounding error. And it had like a half a million Pentastars just sitting in it. And they were like, awesome. We're going to throw them in the Ram Charger. Uh, because it's a tried and true engine. Um, it's interesting. It's pretty reliable as Chrysler products it's go, It's gotten right? more reliable over the For years. Sure. They have made iterative changes to the yeah. engine. And the few like tiny little things that have, you know, kind of been plagued it yeah. in certain generations, um, 
in this application, I think um, you're going to solve most of that, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, with the lifter issues and things like that, like having it do such little work, right? Most of the time is, is actually going to really extend the life of that engine. I think it's a great choice. I to do go too. With it. You know, and, and going back to some of the criticisms of it saying, well, we, you know, it's a truck, you need power. No, 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 no. This thing's going to be sitting here running at a consistent RPM to run a mm -hmm. generator, all right? So it doesn't have to be a high horsepower or right. a high torque motor. It just needs to be something that's optimized yeah. to produce that electricity. So it's, yeah. a, it's a great choice. You've got all the torque in the world and horsepower you need. At the that, right RPM range. Well, even yeah. outside of that, just it's an EV. Oh, in the electric motors, yeah, right? I gotcha. Now, it's not Cybertruck fast, no. okay? It's not Ford F-150 fast. They're, quote, no. <laughs> They're quoting zero to 60 of 4.4 seconds. Yeah. So it's 663 horsepower. Yeah. So yeah. it's yeah. So it's just stupid the, fast. <laughs> yeah. Twenty years ago, we'd be like four, that would have been like the fastest production car. On the planet. Well, we've so, we've argued for a long yeah. time that those you know Cybertruck numbers, the Rivian numbers, uh, those are those are party trick numbers. Right. Nobody should be going that fast in a vehicle that heavy and that big. I mean, to right. be just to be frank, right? Like yeah. You know, 4.4 is more than enough on any day under any conditions uh, yeah. for something that big. So, but it's nice to know. It gives you an idea of what kind of power yeah. is available. Um, so, I, you know, I'm really excited about this truck because I said this before, but I'll elaborate. I've long been an advocate for this type of approach in the EV space. I felt like it would have pushed the industry or actually would have pushed the consumer Yes. Towards adoption far faster than the pure EV. And and look, that is a minority opinion in this in the automotive world. Yeah. People, journalists have been all in on EVs. Don't waste your time on plug-in hybrids. And you know what? It's made no sense. The market is proving yeah. them wrong. Right. It's absolutely proving them wrong. Over 40% of those Jeep Wranglers are now sold in the 40 uh, are sold in the 4xE configuration. And Toyota RAV4 Primes. You can't get one. And it's, it's been ridiculous. There's this weird disconnect between what journalists have been saying and then what people who don't really like EVs or just kind of don't get it or say they don't want to get them. They're arguing against plug-in hybrids for different reasons, neither of yeah. which makes that much sense. I think the thing people have to understand uh, that a lot of people just don't is that electric vehicles provide a different user experience day to day, mm -hmm. right? Driving it around town, it feels different. Now, may not be to your taste. It's not always to our taste. Sometimes we want to drive a rear wheel drive manual sports car, right? Like, so the kind of muted golf cart feel of an EV, not so fun, but most people really like it. And if you can get them to try it, they they'll like understand it. how much they like it. So you have to look at plug-in hybrids or pure EVs or, or any of this stuff from that point of view and understand that if you get people in them, most drivers are going to like them, right? And so uh, then you have journalists with this kind of weird thing, well, well why are you wasting your time on a plug-in EV or whatever? They want to go all electric now. I kind of get it, except they're looking at it completely backwards, right? If your goal is to electrify as many miles of dr driving as possible amongst yeah. the population, right? Not you in your garage, okay? Yep. If you've got a car with 300 miles of electric range, okay, and one person buys that, you're gonna electrify all of their miles. Most people drive 10,000 miles a year, right? Yep. You're gonna electrify 10,000 miles, or you can take that 300 miles of range, split it up amongst six cars, give them all 50 miles of range, sell that to six people, and still electrify 80 to 90% of their driving. So now you're gonna electrify 45,000 miles at right. least, maybe 60,000 miles. So it's a completely backwards way of looking at it if you're trying to electrify miles. Uh, and it's a backwards way of looking at it if you're trying to understand what people like about cars. It doesn't make any sense. I think, I think where they were coming from, and again, I, I completely disagree, is they're thinking, well, if we don't go full EV, we're not going to get the investment that we want from the automobile manufacturers and the infrastructure. Mm. And 
they may be right on the infrastructure side. We've made a lot of progress there, but we're missing a ton of electrified vehicles in the market and yeah. people who actually drive every day. I mean, and you talk about needing the charging infrastructure and things, but more plug-in hybrids means that over time, as we develop that infrastructure, you've brought more people in and introduced them to electrification and they're going to like it. Yeah. Right? I mean, the plug-in so, hybrid, it plugs in at the house every night. Right. That's 99% of the time I'm relying on yeah. what's here and it works. And me. you've gotten the car buyer to invest in the charging yeah. infrastructure at their house yes. rather than needing to invest in it out in the public. I want to pivot away from the Ram charger because as excited as I am about this, Stellantis is telling us this is just the beginning for this type of product. Mm. And that gets me incredibly excited because we know in the product planning that the next Jeep Wrangler is going to have a version of this series hybrid. Okay, so hello, now you have my attention. I don't need a full size truck but I'd love to replace that four by E with something like this. Mm. Okay. Now I don't need the specs that this thing has and nor will the size of the Wrangler very unlikely. It's going to accommodate it. And, okay. and the, and the design approach that's needed for Wrangler, you know, we got live axles. Okay. So that's the tried and true formula, <laughs> solid axles. Right. Sorry. No. Yeah. Um, that's the tried and true formula that's made the Wrangler so successful off road. And it's hard to see, uh, Jeep giving that up and going mm -hmm. to independent uh, suspension. Um, battery size that's in this, 92 kilowatts and 141 miles of range. I doubt we would see that. Yeah. It's, it might be half that. Yeah, because that that would be like five times the size of the battery yeah. in this one, right? Right. So you're, that's not feasible. You're not going to have 27 gallons of fuel. Right. It's going to be a much smaller version of that. Like I could see, um, and we're probably talking 2028. That's what I think the model year will be when we actually see mm. that according to like union agreement documents and product planning. I think you're going to see something in the 400 mile range. Okay. With total range, um, you know, maybe a battery that's half, you know, this range, so like 50 to 60 miles and hallelujah. I would take it yeah. every single day because I'm still going to cover 99% of my miles, my daily commute, driving around town uh, with just that battery. And then I could hook up this trailer, and still be very happy uh, taking this on a road trip and stopping every three hours to fill up with gas right. and having my battery available to power everything. Yeah. Like that would be ideal. And so, you know, I, I'm super stoked about that. Uh, I can't wait to see what they come out with. I wish it was here tomorrow. Yeah. That will be interesting to watch. I, I wonder what they're going to do. Are they going to keep solid axles for that? We've seen, some third party people mm -hmm. develop solid axles with electrification. electrification. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting. Effectively, they've, yeah. they've done well. Yeah, I also. They did it in a Gladiator. Yeah. Right? So yeah. that was their test bed. And right. I, I've kind of always felt like maybe they, behind the scenes, they're really doing this in partnership with Jeep. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, kind of, you know, that's the playground to develop this. But, yeah, it, you know, yeah. it's certainly possible. The all electric RAM will be due out. Um, they say at the end of the year, the Ram Charger, probably first quarter 2025. Okay. That, that's what we're hearing. Uh, we didn't even talk about the Ram 1500, uh, the new engines. They're dropping the V8s. Okay. Right? So you're going to you're gonna have uh, Finistar V6. Uh, hurricane. Hurricane. Hurricane and then Hurricane High Output. Yeah. You know, and then even some crazy Rebel TRX version of that too. So you're going to get a bunch of choices. Ram, you know, they've always given you, just like most truck makers, bunch of different engine choices um you know, they look great you know everybody's lamenting the end of the v8 era uh okay the new engines are more powerful more horsepower more torque better fuel efficiency they're just not gonna sound as cool at the stoplight yeah they're still gonna sound good they're straight sixes and potentially not last as long i don't know we'll see <laughs> i mean I, I, that's that's true right it's a hard nut to crack it is uh but everybody's doing it you yeah, know, I don't uh, have a choice. Yeah. yeah, there is some other things happening in the truck and SUV space uh, here recently. Other things that we're interested in. So, uh, anything in particular that you know you're excited to see come to market in the next couple months? Because there's a lot. There's a lot coming to market. I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> I don't know.
prepare well, for like that. GX 550. I mean, GX 550, Mister Lexus LX. Yeah, yeah you know the the, yeah. the Land Cruiser that's coming back in Prado form, like the GX 550. I think it looks awesome. I love it. <laughs> I, I do. I love it. But guess what? Guess what? It doesn't come with a V8. Doesn't come with a V8. Yeah. What's it coming with? Comes with a twin turbo V6, same engine that's in the new Tundra. Minus the and hybrid. The LX6, uh, 600 yeah, and the LX600. Yeah, and the LX600 and probably in a different output, but yeah, yeah, or the 300 series Land Cruiser overseas, but yeah, we get an LX600 yeah. version. Um, so yeah, I don't, big power numbers, right? So everyone's mad about the V8 leaving, but we can tow more with this one, right? Dude, so originally, the, the tow numbers changed on us this week. Yep. Originally, when they first announced this vehicle, they said 6,500 pounds. Then they came back a little while later and they said 8,000 pounds. And then this week, all the media uh, are assembled in Arizona and Tucson driving these vehicles and Lexus told them a new tow rating. What is it? Was it 9,000? 9,000 and some change. Change in the over trail. There's two package. trim levels okay. that it's available in. Uh, over trail for sure. I can't remember what the other one was. It's uh, probably something without a third row. Yeah, it. that's what we speculated. Yeah. It's the it's the trims with no third row, which is over trail. Airplane. Just, yeah, over trail does not have a third it row. Does not have right? a third row. Yeah, yeah. So nine thousand pounds is a lot. It is. It's it's a lot. Um, I don't know what a a Tundra tows with that motor in it, but. I'm assuming it's like 11 or 12. It's not that much more. Uh, yeah, it's not. I mean, in an SUV, uh, that's that's tremendous. I was looking at something like a GMC Yukon the other day, uh, 8,500 pounds, right? So yeah. uh, actually, I don't even think it's that much. Uh, yeah. I could be misquoting that. Uh, it could be like 7,500 pounds in that, in the AT4. So yeah. that is a huge number. That's going to make a lot of people happy that are towing their Airstreams or you know smaller uh, travel trailers. Uh, just a really cool vehicle. Uh, we did hear from a dealer this week um, that originally they were thinking February for their first delivery, but now they're being told this summer. Mm. My guess is truth is somewhere in between, but good luck getting one. The, yeah. the list is really, really long. Really long. Um, yeah. And I'm, I should I should have got on it immediately. Oh, the Land Cruiser. Yeah. Sister vehicle? Sister vehicle. So, and this is controversial for some reason the kind of the land cruiser community i think americans are a little bit spoiled because we've only had the land cruiser here for a long time and the uh we we'll call it the kind of the 200 series land cruiser right which is the top of the line land yeah. cruiser um they have not sold the land cruiser in the prado version right which uh but they've sold that overseas for a long time which uh, here we've had it as the GX 460, the GX 470 before that mm -hmm. for a couple of decades now, at least that has been available overseas badged as a Toyota Land Cruiser Prado. Mm -hmm. And so, um, with the 200 series Land Cruiser and LX 570 going away, uh, with the 2022 model year, we came over here with the LX 600. For 2023 that's the new 300 series platform and the 300 series land cruiser has gone away for the u.s market they replaced it with this kind of hmm. i think that's what everyone's like oh the land cruiser's coming they're expecting the 300 series and they're disappointed with this i kind of get it as a 200 series owner myself i think the 300s are cool but this is pretty cool too it is cool. It's got a lot more tech than I initially uh -huh. thought it was going to have for off-roading. I think people who uh, are used to taking forerunners out, um, but maybe maybe their family's grown a little bit. They got kids. They need mm -hmm. you know a little bit more room. I think they're going to be really happy uh, replacing uh, those setups with something like this. Um, it now under the hood is different. Very different from the GX five fifty. This two point three liter yeah i thought it was 2.4 it's 2 .3, the same 2 liter. yeah whatever it is it's the same four cylinder turbo that you get in the tacoma now that's right yeah yeah made it to a hybrid setup so it's a pure parallel hybrid I pure think, parallel right? 48 volt yeah. hybrid system so you're gonna get good gas mileage mm -hmm. you get 
gobs of power and torque. Yeah. All right. So that's not going to be a problem. Um, you do have your independent front, but uh, stabilizer, uh, sway stabilizer bar. Stabilizer disconnects. Yeah. Yeah. It does disconnect. Gives yeah. you a little bit more articulation. I'm not sure. It, I, I need to find out more about that. I'm a little confused about it because it's not the same as the EKDSS that nope. you get in the, the GX. GX. Yeah. Um, and the outgoing 200. Uh, center locking diff for sure uh, on the four wheel drive models. At yeah. least I think that's standard. Rear locker, I'm assuming is optional because I know it's optional on the GX. I think it's optional on this as well. Okay. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And then you also, with this that you don't get in the GX, Actually, I'm not sure about that. I know for sure, though, you get like a 2,000 watt inverter or something oh, in okay. this. Because it's, it's optional. Because uh, it's parallel hybrid. Yeah. You can play off, off of that. that. Now, I think there's an inverter option on the GX550 as well, but I'm hmm. assuming it's not as powerful because it doesn't have the battery. Well, so we do know that there's going to be a hybrid version of the GX at some point yes. as well. They keep yeah. saying that, but they haven't given me any specs. Well, either way, uh, very excited to see both of those cars uh, come to market. We have... We have bought into the Toyota uh, longevity hype. Uh, we definitely rely on those vehicles on a daily yeah. basis. Uh, when the Jeep's in for service, I'm driving. I'm driving the GX yeah. 470 around. How many uh, head gaskets are you on now? I, let's not talk about that. Okay. Another vehicle that I'm actually really excited about, and that, look, this is just a rendering. Okay. Uh, the Rivian R2. All right. So the smaller uh, crossover from Rivian. Had a lot of success with the R1T and the R1S, but we now have a date for this. They are going to unveil this on March 7th. Okay, so this is what somebody dreamed up, but we are going to get to see that in about six weeks' time. Uh, and that will be, you know, their mass market crossover. Right? They're going to try to bring that price point down and the size uh, and, you know, sure, probably performance as well uh, in a tidier package. So that's, uh, that's coming to market. I this mean, is a render. This is like a. This is just a, a rendering. Some fan fiction. Yeah, it's bit. fan fiction. There's a ton of them out there in the Rivian forums. Um, I don't know who I, I borrowed this from, but it looks great. Good job. Um, you know, it's going to have a lot of competition. A hell of a lot of competition. Uh, it's you know, everybody's dropping EVs into the market at a time where that interest and demand is starting to waver a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, that's to your benefit. Because yeah. these things are going to hit, you know, and they're going to start discounting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Prices are going to come down and that's great uh, yeah. to get you to adopt. I mean, we've heard of Kia EV9 yeah. showing up on the lots with discounts on the hood. Already. Yeah. And Before that's a phenomenal need... vehicle. Right. Yeah. Great range, tons of features and mm -hmm. priced really well. Yeah. It's a legit three row family SUV. Um, it's fully a electric minivan replacement. Yeah, that's you know? yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is what most family crossovers it's are. More today. like a Ford Flex. Uh, Twenty twenty four is going to be a wild year in uh, the car industry. You're probably going to see, you will, you'll see more change this year uh, than we've seen in a long time. Not just from a technology perspective. I think in the way that consumers buy their cars or lease their cars, what they're looking for. Like it's kind of rubber meets the road time on yeah. what the industry is bringing to the lot and what buyers are actually going to go after. And I, I, I don't remember a time in our lives where that equation was on such shaky ground. Yeah. We love talking cars. Thanks. If you're with us still, thanks for hanging in there. And again, like subscribe uh, to the channel. We'd really appreciate it. Um, you know, we've got you know, more news coming when these uh, automobile companies unveil stuff, we'll jump back in and a lot more cool outdoor content coming too. So how do we end our videos? Awkward way.